Hey guys, Jordan with the Young Turks and TYT Politics. I am in Chicago right now, and I am headed after this to Indiana to do some reporting for the Young Turks and uh, the Fusion show. Uh, Monday, Young Turks on Fusion will be at the University of Chicago, so I'm uh, going to do some interviews today uh, that will be aired on the Fusion show Monday, but uh, couldn't, couldn't let you start your weekend without uh, a little WikiLeaks uh, I've been trying to keep up with uh, new parts as they come out. Uh, it's been a little tricky since I'm out covering other stories as well, um, but doing my best. Uh, this morning, uh, WikiLeaks released part 15, so uh, they've pretty much been releasing new parts every single day. So uh, I, haven't looked, I haven't looked at 15 yet. I'm working backwards. Uh, again, I've been out covering other stories. So uh, once I look into part 15, I will update you on that. Uh, that was just released uh, like an hour or two ago, part 15. But I wanted to uh, give you the highlights that I think of part, um, for, part 14, which was out yesterday. And obviously Hillary Clinton's campaign is still dodging on WikiLeaks. They are deflecting that it's Russia, Russia, Russia. And, you know, we, journalists are treasonous for even mentioning it because they're, quote, stolen documents uh, from the Russian government trying to influence the election. Uh, there's been no concrete evidence of such, but they keep saying it anyway, and their media allies keep repeating it for them. So uh, I'll start with uh, one email that shows uh, even more so that Hillary Clinton's campaign was coordinating with its super PAC, which, if Citizens United actually has any teeth, would be illegal. Uh, the Intercept did great reporting uh, a couple days ago on many examples of Hillary Clinton's campaign coordinating with its super PACs, Correct the Record, and Priorities USA. Uh, this one is John Podesta uh, in December of last year, so during the Democratic primary, um, and he gets an email saying HRC uh, and pro HRC Priorities meeting on Monday with Avi Glazer. Uh, both priorities and HVF. Uh, HVF is the Hillary Victory Fund, which, as Jenk reported uh, months ago, was essentially a money funneling scheme between the DNC and Hillary Clinton's campaign. But as this email shows you, uh, John Podesta is getting from, I think, his assistant uh, a scheduling that he will have a meeting on Monday uh, discussing the campaign with both representatives of Priorities USA, which is one of their super PACs, and the Hillary Victory Fund. So this is right in an email, um, the coordination between Hillary's campaign chairman and Super PAC Priorities USA, December 2015, you know, during the primary, she was already, already announced as a candidate about a month before the, a little bit about a month and a half before the Iowa caucus. Is anything gonna be done about this? Of course not, because Hillary Clinton her allies seem to be able to do whatever they want, uh, either go right up to the line or cross the line of legality and nothing happens. But this is, again, more evidence that uh, they were coordinating illegally with their super PAC. Uh, another email I found interesting, um, one of, it, it's, not, it's one email, but it actually shows a bigger picture. We obviously know that Hillary Clinton in private speeches to banks said, you know, I have a public position that I tell my, tell my supporters. And then there's the private position, which is the truth, which I tell you guys, my, my banker friends. Uh, so it seems Donna Brazil also has public positions versus private positions. She didn't word it as a public position, but I found a tweet she sent out. Uh, I believe it was, let me find it here. Give me a second. I think it was uh, December. Yes. No, excuse me. January of the, January of this year, where she tweets uh, under President Obama. Uh, the economy has experienced a record 70 straight months of private sector job growth, over 14 million jobs, exclamation point. So there's Donna being a great soldier for the Democratic Party. This was probably after one of the jobs reports January of this year saying pres under President Obama, the economy has experienced a record 70 straight months of private sector job growth. Over 14 million jobs, which is a true statement, by the way. She's not lying. Let's see what she told John Podesta in a private email uh, less than a month later. I think people are in more despair about how things are. Yes, new jobs, but they are low-wage jobs. Housing, and she put housing in all, all capitals, housing is a huge issue. Most people pay half of what they make to rent, dot, dot, dot. 
So if you want to be charitable about this email, which a lot of people, when I posted it on Facebook, were getting on me. Yeah, she sent out a tweet that was rah, rah, rah about the economy. But in a private email, she's saying there's more work to be done. No. Yeah, if you want to give, the, give her the benefit of the doubt and be naive, that's, that's your business. But really what this is, is political spin. And Donna Brazil is not the first one to engage in political spin, and she won't be the last one. But what you see, she was a CNN contributor, supposedly neutral. We know that was bogus. But Donna Brazil is, uh, you know, putting out into Twitter, the, you know, the economy is on the rebound and the economy is doing great. But what she really thinks is told to John Podesta, oh, I think people are in more despair about how things are. Yeah, new jobs, but they are low wage jobs. Housing is a huge issue. Most people pay half of what they make to rent. Now, benefit of the doubt to her, her private email, basically acknowledging that the economy is not doing great and most of these jobs are shitty jobs and low pay jobs. At least she recognizes the issue. But what is she doing? She's out in public, rah, rah about the economy. She's going on CNN as an analyst, uh, you know, uh, painting an incorrect picture about the economy being on the rebound and being improved. Um, when we, in private emails, you could tell that she knows it's all artificial. So I think that's a good representation. Uh, Hillary Clinton is not the only one with public positions versus private positions. Uh, most political operatives, uh, when they go on TV, they'll say one thing, they'll put rose-colored glasses on about the economy and other things, but in reality, they know this is all artificial and most people are struggling. Another email. Uh, so when Nancy Reagan passed away, Hillary Clinton uh, uh, made comments uh, about, about her, I think at her funeral, that many people were offended by. Uh, so her campaign was very, uh, you know, frantically trying to uh, write an op-ed for Hillary Clinton apologizing. Um, usually when somebody writes an op-ed, uh, you think, the person's name under the story is who wrote it. We learned that wasn't true because previous WikiLeaks told us that uh, an op-ed written by a gun, gun violence survivor was really written by Hillary Clinton's campaign. It was a hit piece on Bernie Sanders, uh, and Hillary Clinton's campaign essentially wrote it for, uh, wrote, wrote the piece and then slapped this gun violence survivor's name on it. So uh, the same thing apparently happened with this op-ed apologizing for making offensive comments about Nancy Reagan. So you see, okay, everyone, here is a re revised draft of, a, of the statement. It does not, not include the words, I made a mistake in the first line. Because, you know, Hillary Clinton has a problem acknowledging when she makes mistakes. Benefit of the doubt, the final op-ed that they put her name on said uh, it was a mistake, I think, in the third sentence, but she couldn't put it in the first sentence. Um, we need a strategy for getting her to approve this. Obviously, her staff wrote this, and then she has to approve it. I don't know if this means someone who is traveling with her, making the case, or something else, file attached. Um, there's other things There's other things in there that show that her uh, campaign wrote it for her. And by the way, I'm just reading from my tweets, so you can go to my tweets from yesterday. I send out two tweets for each email. The first tweet shows the image, and the second tweet uh, shows the actual link if you want to go in and read these emails because it's, it's very difficult to fit all of it in 140 characters. So I've had to do two tweets. But I think what this shows, of course, politicians don't write their own speeches. It's very rare. Obama, I think, wrote some of his speeches, but they have speech writers. But when you're writing an op-ed that's going out with your name under it, uh, apologizing to uh, you know anyone who was offended by comments you made about HIV and AIDS and Nancy Reagan, uh, and basically your staff writes it for you and has to convince you to even approve the words, I made a mistake, it just shows you who Hillary Clinton is. It, she can't even write a piece for herself. And if you look at this email chain, it was, you know, longer than most of my days are. It, you know, the, the, the waxing and waning over wording and this and that, uh, something else. All right, let's move on. Uh, oh, another Donna Brazil. So, <laughs> sorry, I'm having fun with Donna Brazil. And if you haven't watched the video yet of uh, her and I, I'd call it a confrontation uh, at the third presidential debate, it went crazy viral. I think between Facebook and YouTube, it's, it's definitely got over a million views by now. Uh, so definitely watch that. I had the audacity to challenge her as a journalist, and she tried to play the victim and compare me to Donald Trump badgering women. So when you actually perform journalism nowadays, uh, they're so shocked 
because the rest of the journalists next to me are asking them, oh, how'd she do in the debate? What'd you think of the color she was wearing? And all this nonsense. Um, me actually challenging her when she moved on to her little Russian talking point, I cut her off. And I said, yeah, we've heard this, but what about you passing an email uh, with a question for a town hall the day before the town hall? You passed it off. And by the end of it, she was essentially repeating herself and stuttering. So I was proud of it. Um, so here's another email from Donna Brazil. It is from January of 2016. So she was still a CNN contributor. She was also a uh, vice chair of the Democratic National Committee. Uh, so she was supposed to be neutral as a CNN analyst, as well as a uh, vice chair of the DNC. So she writes an email, uh, I believe, before uh, one of the debates to uh, the Hillary Clinton campaign. I believe it was to John Podesta. She, she writes, time to let out the glory, energy, passion, and a constant riff that will be heard. The policy is done. The ingredients are there. Time to stir. Time to let out the glory, energy, passion, and a constant riff that will be heard. The policy is done. The ingredients are there. Time to stir. I'm sure she sent out a similar email to Bernie Sanders' campaign, encouraging him before his debate that, you know, uh, your, you know, the motivation and the excitement is there. We just you need to, you know, fine, t- fine tailor the policy, Bernie. Uh, so this just shows you it's a joke. These people are not neutral, even though they say they're neutral on CNN. They're either passing questions and tipping off uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign, the questions she's going to get, or sending them cheerleading emails, time to let out the glory. And again, Donna Brazil's not a bad person. This isn't like a personal attack on Donna Brazil. I don't really know her. I've met her twice, and she seems like a nice person. But she is a part of the Democratic establishment. And as such, it's ridiculous to watch CNN during the primary when they have about 25 Hillary Clinton supporters on, two or three Bernie Bernie Sanders supporters, who frankly I thought were pretty weak. Um, And then the analysts, who are not supposed to be publicly supporting anyone, uh, are clearly in the tank for Hillary Clinton. And how could they not be? Most of these people, they haven't known student loan debt or actual economic struggle for many, many years. So they're not going to sympathize with Bernie Sanders' movement or the people he's representing. Uh, Moving on to uh, what I thought was interesting. So Hillary, there was a debate in, inside the Hillary Clinton campaign about a guy named Tom Steyer uh, naming him as a, uh, I don't know, an honorary chairman or the chairman of Cali- her California campaign. Uh, he, is, uh, he runs a super PAC called Next Generation, which I believe is a, a, very, it's a very big uh, environmental super PAC. It's very big against uh, pipelines. He, was, he went hard against Keystone. I'm pretty sure it's the position on Dakota Access would be the same. So the super PAC he represents is pretty damn good. Uh, but Tom Steyer wanted to be like an honorary chairman of the campaign. He said if he was honorary chairman of the campaign, he would delegate his super PAC responsibilities to you know subordinates under him um, and not be, so, not be connected to the super PAC, which is another joke. So Robbie Mook, who's Hillary Clinton's campaign manager, who, by the way, credit to Robbie Mook, a lot of these emails shows that he was he kept on saying, no, like, no, Bill Clinton should not be giving a speech to Morgan Stanley three days after she announced. And he was the voice of reason against some of these more greedy instincts of the Clintons not to try to make money when she when Clinton is trying to present herself as a true progressive. Anyway, so uh, Robbie Mook says, no, I don't think we should have this guy as the chairman of California. Um, It's a bad optic. You know, yeah, he could say he's not involved with the super PAC, but People aren't going to buy that. So there's a whole email chain about it. And John Podesta, very clear what this sentence shows, maybe could be leaving a lot of dollars on the table. So that's our democracy, folks. Yeah, it probably would be a bad decision to let him into the campaign since he runs a super PAC, but could be leaving a lot of money on the table if we don't. That's how, these, this, that's how this campaign operated. It was a fine, fine, well-oiled machine, essentially to try to make as much money as humanly possible. Jenk just reported yesterday that the, I think between both campaigns, over a billion dollars has been fundraised by now, most of it coming from Hillary's side. And the mindset was, we got we to make, make, make the dollars. This is not a time for ethics. We got to bring in the money. Because they knew Hillary Clinton sure as hell not going to get the small dollar contributions that Bernie Sanders was raking in. 
even though they tried to send out these ridiculous emails asking for a dollar here or a dollar there to try to make it seem like they were, you know, getting just as much small dollar contributions. So Podesta was like, eh, I don't want to leave them. We don't want to leave the money on the table. Moving on. Uh, Podesta, again, this wasn't like a big deal. It just shows what, you know, how he is. So uh, there was a concern in the campaign about leaks, you know, information getting leaked out to the press, which is common in presidential campaigns. You know, who, we got to plug the leak, who's leaking information. So there was a whole email chain and Podesta says about the leaks, I'm happy to fire someone for leaking, whether they did or they didn't. <laughs> so I thought that was just interesting. I mean, it's not a condemnation on Hillary Clinton, but it shows what the campaign is like. It's ruthless. Yeah, I don't care. You, over there. Did you leak? No, sir, I didn't. Fuck you. Get out of here. You're fired. So I think <laughs> that's, that's kind of uh, the, the operating MO here. Um, moving on. Uh, another email. Oh, so uh, Ken Salazar, who is a former senator of Colorado. He is known as one of the biggest fractivists. He's very pro-fracking. He, uh, he famously said there's not, quote, not been a single case where fracking harmed the environment. Uh, he is now the head of her transition team. You know, uh, they set up their transition teams before they're elected uh, to, you know, recruit cabinet members, staffers, all that. So she got a lot of heat for this guy being the head of her transition team. Well, guess what? He was also advising her during the primary. So when Hillary Clinton was saying, oh, climate change, you got to tackle climate change. And whether she, when she was giving nauseatingly com- complex answers on fracking, Bernie Sanders said, yeah, we should ban fracking. She, you know, uh, foamed at the mouth trying to give an explanation, uh, but essentially said, yeah, I'll allow fracking. Uh, But under, it'll be very tough due to the regulations I'm going to impose. Well, this guy, Ken Salazar, was advising them uh, as as recently as June of 2015 during the primary on hiring state directors. He thought that they needed to beef up their Colorado operation, which is the state he is from. So I thought that was interesting because it shows you who these people are taking, who Clinton's campaign not only is taking money from, but is taking advice from. Uh, Fractivists who say fracking has never harmed anybody in the environment. But on the other end, she's going out, you know, talking up her climate change uh, credentials and not being very honest with the American people about her stance on fracking, which to a private bank, she said, I want to defend natural gas. I want to defend fracking under the right circumstances, which is a dodge. Uh, Another email. Uh, uh, This one was interesting. Uh, They they had a conservative blogger named Lois Mensch from the UK. Uh, She used to have a position in the UK government. She's conservative. Apparently, she was like helping them come up with advertising ideas and all this stuff. Her name's Lois Mensch, L-O-U-I-S-E-M-E-N-S-C-H. So she sent an email with advertising suggestions. Um, But for the national version, the other knock on Hillary, unfair as it might be, is the idea that she feels entitled. An ad showing all her hard work and stumping not only hit Sanders on his Johnny-come-lately stuff, she's stumped for 506 Democrats, he's run against 23, made up stats, but you get my drift, but actually shows that far from feeling entitled, Hillary's... uh, Hillary's hard, hard work for the Democrats started in college and has continued every year and decade since. She is the least entitled person imaginable compared to the in-it-for-myself opponent who joined your party last bloody year. So you hear the British in there, last bloody year. Again, Hillary Clinton's campaign. Who are they, con- who are they consulting with? A, cons- a conservative from the UK, a conservative blogger who says Bernie Sanders is in it for myself. And that continued this nonsense narrative they had. He's not even a Democrat, making it seem like, you know, it was like a red scare. He's a communist, uh, that he's not a Democrat, which I think a lot of people thought was a good thing that Bernie wasn't a lifelong Democrat. A uh, couple more. Oh, by the way, uh, I tweeted yesterday, but there was a new, a new pipeline leaked in Pennsylvania. Uh, as of last night, 55,000 gallons leaked. So, yeah, pipelines don't leak. Nothing to see here. Um, this one I thought was really something... So the night of Michael Brown's grand jury, obviously Michael Brown was the African-American shot down in Ferguson, left in the street for hours, dead before he was taken away. Uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign, shocker, waxed and waned whether she should release a statement. 
She was already coming out, I, I believe at six o'clock to uh, a statement about something else. So they said, should we make a statement preemptively about not so much his case, but the overall problem of police brutality and blah, blah, blah. So different people said different things. Some people in the campaign said she should come out after the grand jury announcement and make another statement. Some people said not. So uh, the, Nick and I just raised it with her. She doesn't want to. Sensitive to a few things. Decision won't be announced until two hours after we speak. This statement is long and over the top. If she does a statement, should be short like Claire McCaskill. She never spoke out when the two African-American men were killed in New York. She would prefer to say amen to POTUS and Attorney General, not to preempt any other statements. She's, she's decided to... She, this sentence doesn't make sense, so I'm not going to read it. The last one is the key. We have not heard from any of our friends who say she must speak out now. Dun, dun, dun. So who are these friends? I don't know. But knowing the Clinton MO, we have not heard from any of our friends who says she must speak out now. My assumption is they're talking about their money men. If Donald Trump has been right about anything, all these, all these politicians, they're puppets and the donors are their masters. Uh, you know, I'm speculating, but I can't really imagine who they're talking about. We have not heard from any of our friends who say she must speak out now. Maybe they're talking about fellow politicians. I don't know. But uh, I think that shows there's no core conviction there that I, I should speak out or I shouldn't. But because I haven't been instructed by either donors or other politicians to, I'm not going to do it. So the moral, the moral courage is crazy. Um, this one I thought was really telling, another John Podesta goodie. Uh, somebody wrote to him, um, you know, Bernie Sanders, uh, it, apparently uh, the single payer plan, a lot of people don't agree with it, but uh, it's catching on. Uh, John Podesta writes, his actual proposal sucks, but we live in a lefty alternative universe. That was the campaign chairman for Hillary Clinton. We live in a lefty alternative universe. Ironically, John Podesta didn't think we lived in a lefty alternative universe in previous emails where he said, thank God for single payer upon turning 65 and getting Medicare. So uh, Bernie Sanders policies to try to get single payer for everybody, lefty alternative universe. But when he got Medicare, thank God for single payer. The hypocrisy is heartwarming, isn't it? Uh, moving on. This one I thought was really interesting. So Hillary Clinton's campaign in an email, uh, they're talking about Bernie Sanders' campaign and you know, how, to, how to phrase him, how to do this. So they say the idea here is make it clear that the protest vote has been heard. So they're talking about Bernie Sanders supporters, how not to alienate them. Make it clear that their protest vote has been heard, minimizing Bernie supporters to a protest vote. Uh, they, they like to talk about Jill Stein this way as well. Uh, none of this changes the basic problem that compared to Bernie, we're never going to be the change candidate. And so we're either confident in our own identity or we're chasing him and offering ourselves as a pale imitation. I think we're on to something good with our new message that change is about pushing hard, getting knocked down, etc. because it puts her best attributes in service of progressive ends. But that's still process and incrementalism. So at least the campaign is acknowledging she is the process and incre incrementalism campaign. You know, they, they spun it around as the prog progressive who gets things done, but she's the process and incrementalism change candidate. Moving on. Uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign, who once called Bernie Sanders' campaign the most negative in Democratic primary history. Let me show you the email they wrote here. I think our press team places stories on guns and, on, and honesty and, uh, excuse me, I think our press team places stories on guns and honesty and anything else that makes him have a bad day. So what they're talking about is placing negative stories on guns and his honesty, which, what stories are you going to attack him on about honesty? That's a joke. Uh, with their friends in the press. So it just shows you, yeah, they're going on there with this reverse psychology, how Bernie Sanders is running the most negative campaign in history. Meanwhile, they're trying to place negative stories all day long with the press. After all, they were the ones who started this Bernie bro bullshit, which uh, previous, a Daily Beast reporter actually exposed them as emailing her, trying to get her to write about Bernie bros. Um, 
that's it for uh, the emails I found yesterday. As I said, I'm going to go through part 15 when I can. I'm going out to do field interviews now, and then I'm flying home to New York, so it might be a little delayed. But uh, Podesta emails 15 is out. Um, I will try my best to email, uh, tweet out the ones I can. Uh, when I get home tomorrow, I am actually going to take a day off because I've been, I haven't been home in quite a while and I'm still a little sick. So, uh, you know, apologies if you don't hear from me as much, but uh, I can't be any good to you if I'm on uh, zero energy and uh, running on reserve tanks. So thank you for watching. Uh, YouTube.com slash TYT Politics. If you're not subscribed, that's our channel, TYT Politics. We are at 90, almost at 94,000 subscribers. We're trying to get to 100,000 as soon as possible. Uh, so if you haven't subscribed, you could watch videos like this on TYT Politics, as well as my reporting from Standing Rock, uh, where I covered the Dakota Access Pipeline that the Native Americans are fighting. And I also was just in Detroit covering, uh, you know, gang violence and other things there. Thanks for watching, guys.